General Theory of Value by Ralph Barton Perry A work of ethics published in 1926 The main ideas of which are Any object acquires value when any interest, whatever it be, is taken in it. If some va objects are more valuable than others, it is only because some interests are stronger than others. Man is distinguished from the other animals in being able to plan ahead in accordance with his interests. There are various kinds of values corresponding to various kinds of interests. Values are inherited or acquired, positive or negative, recurrent or progressive, real or playful, aggressive or submissive, subjective or objective. The highest good is an ideal, a harmonious society of benevolent persons, but the ideal depends upon an interest in working out conflicts cooperatively. Ralph Barton Perry's theory of value in terms of interest remains one of the most detailed and carefully defended statements of empirical value theory to be found in the history of philosophy. Its very matter-of-fact air and its careful progression from point to point are characteristic of American thought when it is both plain and respectable, as it sometimes is now and again. There is nothing exciting or revolutionary about Perry's ideas, but what he brings about by his analysis is a new temper of philosophical thought, one in which attention to the facts of the matter takes precedence over recourse to the eternal and elusive realm of ideas. Later philosophers on the subject, such as Charles Leslie Stevenson in his Ethics and Language of 1944, may lay stress on the emotive functions of language, uh, value language, and they may look with forbearance on studies which centre on their attention on value itself, not on language, but for all that no significant rebuttal of Perry's theory has been forthcoming. Uh, not yet anyway, but it'll come. No rebuttal is likely because, so it's argued anyway, because the theory that any object, whatever it be, acquires value whenever any interest, whatever it be, is taken in it, is so general, so plausible, so continuously verifiable, that any quarrel about it is likely to be petulant, involving some plaintive appeal to intuition of the indefinable, or something like that, or pedantic reducing itself to quibbles about phrasing or method. So, this is good praise for a work of 20th century philosophy, but the work is not without its value, if I may put it that way. It was no easy task for modern thinkers to turn their minds from conceptions, essences, and presumably eternal, immutable, and unanalyzable truths to those parts of the world of experience that give substance and sense to human discourse. But Perry, together with other empiricists, with other empirical and analytic philosophers, has not only pioneered philosophically, but has done so with such diligence and skill that the results of his investigations are worth considering long after we have ceased to be enchanted by the skillful amendations which later philosophers have advanced. Perhaps it should be made clear that Perry's general theory of value is significant in philosophy, not because of its novelty, but because of the novelty of its genesis. The age of analysis of, as Morton Wright has termed the age of 20th century philosophy, is distinguished from earlier philosophical periods by its central concern with analysis of some sort, as opposed to synthesis or system building. Of course, there are living philosophers whose trust is in what is claimed to be the philosopher's peculiar and non-analytic insight, his intuition, who reject the attempt to explain or dissect value and who prefer to call attention to value as something unique, ultimate and beyond the possibility of analysis. England's Sir David Ross in his influential The Right and the Good of 1930 has shown himself to be one of these old-fashioned philosophers, old-fashioned in the literal sense of holding to the fashion of thinkers
in the thickest of any age prior to his own, to our own. But Perry quite aptly terms himself the one who tries to bridge the gap between common sense and science, and who believes that philosophy must face the facts of life and nature, taking them as both the point of departure and the touchstone of truth. Perry's theory is a general theory in that it attempts to explain value quite without regard to any question as to whose value is under consideration or as to what kind of value it is. Perry is well aware of the fact, which anyone in his right mind acknowledges, some quite seriously, that what is valued differs from place to place and person to person, and that what is valued may be valued in different ways, even by the same person. But what he is concerned in his theory of value to explain is precisely what is involved in a situation in which something, it does not matter what, is of value. It does not matter of what kind or for what reason to someone. It does not matter who. Perry is not blind to the relevance of the study of the use of language for one who would identify the subject of his philosophical discourse. And I quote, The task of the theory of value may be regarded as the study of the act of valuing or as the study of the predicate valuable, he writes. End quote. Nor is Perry na to, naive enough to suppose that by turning to the word value all ambiguities are resolved and all data given. I quote, The fact is that the word value, instead of having a clear denotation like the word house, refers us to a region whose nominal boundaries have yet to be agreed upon. End quote. A nice distinction is drawn between the empirical aspect of philosophical inquiry, which involves a topographical survey of all to which attention has been called by the use of the term value, and the legislative act of deciding to limit the denotation of the term to a certain part of the area surveyed. It is just that distinction amongst others which Wittgenstein was concerned to make and, dis and illustrate in his philosophical investigations. Before developing and defending at some length the proposal that any object of any interest is valuable, Perry examines and discards the opposed ideas that value is irrelevant to interest, that value is the qualified object of interest, that value is the object of qualified interest. In considering value as irrelevant to interest, Perry considers the idea that value is immediately perceived as G. E. Moore claimed in Principia Ethica of 1903, objecting to the view that value is an indefinable characteristic inherent in objects and empirically discoverable there, Perry calls attention to the close relationship between value and the interest in agreeable feelings. He suggests that it is only on the assumption that value is an empirical property that the analogies between value and other properties such as colour properties have any persuasive force. The claim that value is an indefinable property present for all is witness to witness is weakened by consideration of the fact that it is always relevant in determining the value of an object to go from one judge to another. The verdicts vary because men vary, as do their interests with their differences. Finally, Perry rejects the identification of value with some such property as fitness or self-realization. He argues that fitness or self-realization, as well as organic unity, are understandable only by reference to interest. The distinction between the idea that value is the qualified object of interest and the idea that value is the object of qualified interest is not as subtle as might at first seem. According to the first view, certain objects are preeminently qualified to evoke interest. Perry reviews the most prominent ideas of this sort, the idea that only those objects which are purposive are truly worthy of interest, the idea that the good is the desirable when desirable means that which actually evokes desire the idea that the valuable objects are those which are 
capable of evoking desire, as distinguished from actually evoking it. And finally, the idea that the object which has value is the object which ought to be. The errors resident in these various ideas, according to Perry, are either instances of supposing that objects actually have the properties of responses human beings make to objects, or of limiting the area of value to whatever most concerns the philosopher in question. According to the second view, the view that value is the object of qualified interest, only those objects are valuable which become the objects of an interest in some way distinguishable from other interests that might be taken in objects. For example, it might be held that only an interest or desire which is har harmonious with nature or with the will of God is a real interest, a value-determining desire. Or it might be maintained that only a rational will can determine value. That an object is valuable only if it would be desired, were the reason in control of desire. Several other ideas, variants of these, are considered by Perry. He concludes that the various kinds of interest which various philosophers have put forward as authoritative and value-determining are none of them paramount and preeminently value-creative, but they do determine various kinds of value. Having shown what is unsatisfactory in the claim that value is the qualified object of interest, and in the claim that value is the object of qualified interest, Perry then puts forward his preferred generic theory of value, the theory that value is any object of any interest, that whatever the interest, desire, concern for or in an object, the fact of that interest having been taken determines the object as an object of value. I quote, That which is an object of interest is a or ipso invest, invested with value. End quote. After noting that the idea is not entirely novel, since it may be found in the works of Spinoza, Santayana, and Prowl, Perry mused, and I quote, It may appear surprising that a doctrine so familiar, if not banal, as that just stated, should have received so little authoritative support. End quote. The unpopularity of the idea among professional philosophers is attributed to philosophical interest in some specific value to the neglect of generic value, and Perry attributes the interest in specific values to the interest in forcing value theory to support some religious or metaphysical notions which would otherwise collapse. The obvious weakness in this theory is in its very breadth. If an object is made valuable by an act of interest, how could anyone be disappointed? How could some desires be unworthy of virtuous men? It might seem that Perry's theory involves a truly vicious, since indiscriminate, relativism. But Perry does not evade this criticism. He meets it by declaring that a genetic theory of value naturally does not account for organizations of value which result in giving preferences to certain interests over others. He does not deny that relative to certain to a certain interest, another interest might be wrong, but what he insists upon is the revelatory character of his principal thesis that generically considered an object has value if some interest has been taken in it. A truly vicious relativism, he declares, is one which fails to recognize the relation, the relation of interest between subjects and objects. This is a point well worth emphasizing to say, as Perry does, that an object eval of, has value if someone takes an interest in it, is not to say that there is no such thing as value, or that value is not worthy of consideration, an ironic claim, because after all, it is merely a function of interest. To realize that, that there is a sense in which interest confers value on objects is to be liberated from the old constrictive notion that either values are inherent in objects, in which case we should all agree on value considerations, or all discourse about value is meaningless, in which case all value disputes are senseless. And Perry merits serious attention for his view that emphasis on any one kind of interest with subsequent upgrading of some 
particular species of value, is itself an expression of interest, a dogmatic conferring of value on one attitude to the exclusion of other concerns. In his analysis of interest, Perry refused to limit himself to an examination of introspective data. He preferred to look for interest in the open, upon the plane and in the context of physical nature. Writing in 1926, Perry hailed the advance of psychology as a result of its behavioristic direction and contended that a thorough study of value involves taking advantages of methods which have proved so useful. Consequently, a chapter is devoted to the biological approach to interest and another to the psychological definition of interest. The capacity to act in accordance with one's expectations, the ability to plan ahead and to form plans in the service of present inclinations is what distinguishes man, although not sharply but by degree, from other animals. Having claimed this, Perry offers a definition of interest which fits in with the biological and psychological study of man. And I quote, An act is interested insofar as its occurrence is due to the agreement between its accompanying expectation and the unfulfilled phases of a governing propensity. End quote. In other words, if someone wants something, a house, and acts by assembling wood, nails and other materials, because of expect his expectation that by following a certain procedure, as outlined in the house plans, he can achieve what he wants, then he is interested as he acts. This account of interest in general is carefully elaborated by Perry, and it fulfills his intention of explaining interest without having to assume scientifically inexplicable phenomena or capacities in the human being. In reading Perry, one who is reminded not only of Spinoza, whom Perry quotes with favour because of Spinoza's claim that things are good because we like them, but also of Montaigne, who, realising that the worth of things is most dependent on our attitudes than on the nature of things, urge the good sense of changing our attitudes whenever we are dissatisfied with things. Behind Perry's systematic and pedagogical, si pedagogical style, one discerns the active and practical interest in using value theory as an instrument of human freedom. In pointing out that adaptability is peculiar to men, he is in effect urging that men use their ability to plan ahead in order to satisfy their interests. Nothing could be farther from the old idea of making life fit patterns of conduct derived deductively from presumed revelations of divine will. In support of his thesis that there are various kinds of interests and consequently various species of value, Perry devotes several chapters to what he calls modes of interest. His survey encompasses the relations between reflex, habit, instinct, an account of positive and negative interests in terms of approach and withdrawal, clarification of the distinction between recurrent interest, interest which succeeds itself, in relation to objects present in the immediate future, and progressive interest, interest which arises with the coming into existence of a certain object of interest. A study of the difference between real interest and play interest. A comparison of aggressive with submissive interest. And finally, a discussion of those modes of interest involving pleasure, pain and emotion. Perry concludes that values like interests because they are because that values like interests because they are functions of interest can be categorized as inherited or acquired, positive or negative, recurrent or progressive, real or playful, aggressive or submissive, subjective or objective. Perhaps the most helpful part of Perry's defense of his theory is his account of value judgments. Perry shows that although interest can be distinguished from cognition, the two are intimately interdependent. Interest affects cognition, and cognition affects interest. Our interest is moving ourselves 
Our interest in moving ourselves results in our acquiring knowledge and our knowledge of objects has its effects on our interests. It is not surprising then that Perry decides that judgments of value are similar to other kinds of judgments. Judgments of values, and I quote, have their indices, their predicates and their objects, they are true or false. It is this claim that judgments of value are true or false, which proponents of the theory that valid judgments are merely expressions of emotion find so disturbing. But Perry underscores his point by, defi by definition and example. And I quote, To be valuable is to be object of interest. To be judged valuable is to be judged to be object of interest. For example, the judgment peace is good, is true, when there is an interest such that peace is its objective. It is not necessary that peace should exist or that the question of its existence should be raised. End quote. Perry's analysis does not neglect the problems which arise because of the conflicts of interest within an individual or between individuals. He regards apologetic reasoning as the effort to find a common ground for harmonious action. Society is not a person and cannot be treated as a person. It is a composition or interrelation of men, a composition in which individual men by their actions affect and modify each other. According to Perry, interest may be integrated through common objects or by becoming objects for one another or through mediating one another. The hope of achieving the constructive integration of the various interests of men in society depends upon benevolent cooperation, a kind of general willingness to utilize the various mo modes of social integration. How is a critique of values possible for one who regards value as a function of interest? Perry answers that an an uh, illuminating answer depends upon recognizing the possibility that one interest may become dominant and relative to that interest, an act or object of another interest may become to be rejected. To take an example, which is not Perry's, a cake may be a good cake, the very best available, but that means only that as an object of interest in cake, this cake takes precedence over other cakes but the interest in remaining slim may take precedence over the interest in eating cake, and con consequently, relative to that latter interest, eating cake is bad. Uh, this is profound stuff. If Perry seems to depart at all from his cautious and fruitful value, rel and fruitful value relativism, it is in his concluding chapter. The highest good. Perry endorses an ideal realizable by men as the highest good. It is an ideal which presupposes a harmonious society of benevolent persons. But is harmony a value to the man who lives by conflict, who finds satisfaction only in struggle and in the hope and realization of victory? According to Perry's own, vict own theory, if conflict is an object of interest, then it is a value. How then account for this concluding endorsement of harmony and benevolence? Without having to win his point by an awkward calculation of comparative worse, Perry argues that if all would concur in working out a resolution of conflicts cooperatively, the resultant situation would be better for all. And if the resolution of conflicts was such that no greater interest would be elicited by some other res resolution, such a state of affairs would be the ideal, the greatest good relative to the interest of each. The highest good then is such a, and I quote, as judged by and only as judged by, the standard of inclusiveness hypothetically applied. Because the value is in a sense conditional, no violence is done to Perry's relativism. As a critically articulated empirical philosophy of value, as an examination of the role of interest in that broad area in which the word value in its most general use calls attention, Ralph Barton Perry's general theory of value 
still remains a provocative statement to be reckoned with by anyone who supposes that value terms are meaningless or that value is an ultimate and unanalyzable aspect of reality. If you want to get deeper account of value, I suggest you read Hegel. The end.